Today I'm joined by Katie Clary, founder of Peace for Animals. Welcome, Katie. Hi, how are you? All right, Good great. Morning. So let's just uh, kind of get started with your background a little bit. Yeah, you grew up in North Shore of Chicago, is that right? I did. Yes, I did. Uh, and then I've been out in LA for about 15 years now. I actually spent some time in North Shore, or actually Lake Shore, I should oh. say, because I went to the University of Chicago and oh. spent probably the two coldest winters in my life. But I really fell in love with the city. It's just incredible. Now, one of the things in your bio that you mentioned is that you grew up with just your mother. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, single mom. Yep. And mom. Uh, you, you seem to credit her a lot with kind of how you became who you are today. Would you like to share just a little bit about that? 100% Sicilian mom. You know, you can imagine a lot of people in Chicago are Irish, Italian, you know, and it was like they, you know, in the early turn of the century, everyone was, you know, came off the boat, they were all fighting, and then all of a sudden they started getting married and having kids. So I'm a product of that. So half Italian, half Irish. And um, it, it came from a very, very strong, um, uh, you know, like I said, strong family, strong belief system. Uh, and my mom, you know, had to do it on her own uh, ever since I was about 10 months old. Uh, so you know, I, uh, I credit her with everything because I don't think I would have the strength to do what I'm doing today and actually move out to LA um, on my own, having, I, I really didn't know a soul here when I moved out. Um, I just kind of took a chance, shipped out my car and, um, you know, I thought this is something that I need to pursue, uh, you know, not only the entertainment side, but um, eat, like I said, utilizing entertainment as that platform to raise awareness for animal welfare. So um, in the back of my mind, animal welfare was always there. I just didn't know how I was going to transition uh, into it um, like I did when I when I turned 30. So if I'm understanding correctly, uh, because of your kind of ethnic mixed background, you never lose a fight, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two very strong families, but the Sicilian side, yeah, you don't want to, <laughs> you want to mess with them. But no, it's uh, it's good, you know. It, it, I, I, uh, I would say, I have a strong personality, definitely type A. Um, I don't let anyone, you know, walk all over me, and I'm very opinionated in a good way. So, you know, uh, I think there can be good and bad with that. Totally yeah. understand. Well, I'm yeah. originally from South Korea, and you know, my only family was my mother. Uh, up till about age 13. And most people don't know that. But I think one of the things that's benefit to having your mother as your primary caregiver, at least for me, was that I feel that I'm much more understanding and empathetic towards the opposite gender. And mm -hmm. I understand their perspective. And, I, and there's a greater respect because mm -hmm. my main guardian was my mother. In some ways, it's interesting because if you look at some great leaders, uh, past presidents and other leaders, it's interesting because they come from a somewhat of a broken family and they were raised typically by their mothers. And something mm -hmm. about them kind of creates this inner drive. So I, I'm not sure about you, but I certainly have that inner drive. So I'm curious to know, you had this drive early on to potentially break into the entertainment business. Talk mm -hmm. to us about your journey from moving from Chicago to LA. And in the early part of your career, you got into America's Next Top Model and then eventually to Deal No Deal. Tell us about that journey. Wow, it was quite the roller coaster, I gotta say. Um, so, you know, I, I started when I was about 11 years old uh, in entertainment. So I was approached um, actually at the, a festival downtown with my mom by an agent from Elite. Um, uh, in Chicago and they had a, a kids division. So it was Stuart Talent. So uh, my mom never really wanted me to get involved in it. Although um, there's other people that had approached me and she said, you know, I don't really like the business. It's, you know, um, it's tough. You have to have very thick skin and there's a lot of projection. And she was, she was protecting me. And I totally understand that um, in hindsight. And so uh, at the time I was like, you know, really upset that she didn't really want me to get involved in it. So um, I, I convinced her, I said, you know, um, you have the angel's card can we go see it or see her, you know, and, and do a little meeting and uh, meet and greet. And she, and she did agree after I begged her and begged her and begged her. And then um, I got signed with Stuart Talent when I was very young, uh, you know, and that's kind of how my, my career began in Chicago. Uh, and then I would travel a little bit here and there, but my focus um, was always school. And, and my mom always wanted to make sure that, you know, I didn't lose that, um, you know, um, that focus in my life because she knew that, you know, if, if, something fell through that I would always have a backup. I would always have school to, you know, to be there. And especially college, she always wanted me to finish college. So um, she was always just the driving force. She knew that um, I was, I was going to do uh, much more in with my life, you know, not just entertainment, but she, I would talk about animals and endangered species and always incorporate that into, you know, um, into growing up, you know, rescuing animals with her. We would rescue kittens and bottle feed them, find them homes. We'd rescue wild animals. I mean, you name it, squirrels that fell out of the tree, uh, birds, and, you know, bottle feed them. We had a, a family vet that they, we would bring them to and rehabilitate them. And, and then, of course, we release them into the wild. So um, 
you know, I, I think for me, for me, it was a calling, I believe at a young age, um, not the entertainment side, but, but the animals, I believe it was a calling, a higher calling for me, mm -hmm. um, a mission in my life. Um, I didn't know how it was going to transition into what it is now, but I'm blessed that, uh, you know, I founded Beast for Animals and, and were able to help anti-poaching units in Africa, help save endangered species, elephants and rhinos. Um, we're, we're, you know, partnering with a lot of different organizations and, um, and really hoping that we can, you know, make an impact in this world before it's too late because we are in a race against extinction at this point. There's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot more, but yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about a couple of things. One is, I want to go back a little bit is that I think your mother was very sagacious and thinking ahead in terms of the fact that you know, when she referenced tough skin, I mean, in many times when you're in modeling or entertainment business, you're effectively treated as a product. I mean, when you go to casting calls, I mean, you're effectively being evaluated constantly. And it's very difficult not to take it on a personal level. So how did you learn to uh, develop and mature in such a way that you delineated yourself personally from what you're trying to do from a gig and casting? You know, um, in the beginning, you know, a lot of these, these agents, um, I'm not going to name, name any names, but um, they know you're young and they like to take advantage of, of young girls. And so I think from a young age, I was always very confident in, in who I was. And, and um, you know, I, I saw other people getting taken advantage of and I would step in. And I said, you know, you, you can't, you can't take this. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to um, do what's right. And you can't let people step all over you because just because you're a young female and that just began in this, this, you know, business, I mean, that's what they're looking for. These people, you know, not only that, but photographers and, you know, you hear the stories. I mean, I'm sure you've hear, heard a million stories of what happens, you know, um, the casting couches and the auditions. And it's like, you know, it, it's, I never circamed to that because I just, I didn't want, I knew who I was and I knew that it wasn't, that wasn't the NLB all. I knew that I was just utilizing this platform to raise awareness for something greater, which is the animal. So, um, you know, and, and I would tell the people that I worked with as well, all the young models, is, you know, you have to um, stand up for yourself and you can't let, let people uh, step all over you. And if you think something's wrong, then it's wrong and you need to, you need to speak up. I, I see this parallelism uh, from what you're saying in terms of your early childhood uh, as a model to the animal protection and rights is that, you know, when you're a young child, uh, actor or a, a model, you need the protection of your guardian, legal guardian, to make sure that they're advocating for you and protecting your rights. Similarly for animals, they can't speak. They need to have representation to protect their rights. Uh, even though it's not part of the human rights. So I think in some ways uh, you learn to not just advocate and ensure that your rights are protected, but you're protecting the rights of animals that really can't protect themselves. On my podcast, I'm very direct and I don't beat around the bush, which is that there are many actors <laughs> and artists that typically kind of latch onto a cause because it's just the right popular thing to do. Sometimes they'll actually go to the safaris or distant remote locations and take photo shoot. But really, in yeah. reality, it's just just all mirage. Whereas in your uh -huh. case, you're going deep. I mean, you're getting into legislative, you're getting into policy. You're out there. Yeah. This is not just some PR stunt. This is who you are. So tell me about your passion. Why, why do you care so much about the animals? Yeah. So, I mean, this started when I was, I'm, I'm just turned 38 on Saturday. So um, it started when I was, like I said, 11 years old. So um, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be a zoologist. I, I would talk about this to my family. I would, you know, um, but because of the entertainment, I thought, well, you know, it does, people listen to, you know, and I'm not going to say it's a, a sad reality, but if you do have a platform and you're in entertainment um, and you have a following, they want to hear what you have to say. And so I thought, well, that's more, that's more valuable you know, I can, I can really use that. I could go and, you know, and like I said, pass legislation. I mean, I had no idea it was going to be at, at to this level and I'm so blessed it, it is because I think that that's really where you make the positive change. I mean, whether it's on a, a state level, California being the fifth largest economy, I really think that if you can pass legislation in California, it will translate to other states. So um, I was actually, you know, originally it was just endangered species uh, with peace for animals. It branched out into the plant-based movement, um, climate change. There's a lot of other things that we work on. And then policy uh, kind of came to me. It was uh, through another organization, Social Compassion and Legislation, our partner organization. And they asked me to be on the board. And, you know, they said, 
we would love to have you speak. Um, you, I was on Deal or No Deal at the time, and it was my, you know, my first introduction into it, and I had no idea, um, you know, eight, nine years later, it would lead to this. And we, we passed several bills in the last couple of years that have really made a big impact, not only on a state level, but on a national level. So, um, you know, I, it started when I was a kid. You know, I, I always knew it was a mission, and, and even my best friend, actually, she's she's with me right now. Um, she's she directed my first film. She's writing the second one about animal welfare, and she would say, "I remember in high school, you would scream and say, stop! There's a kitten in the, in the middle of the road. You have to stop!'" And so it, I wish she was here to explain it to you guys. But um, I mean, she would tell everybody this, and she, you know, she knows me better than anybody. And of course, you know, I brought her on board to do the, the first documentary and she was never really involved in animal welfare. And uh, I said, like, you know, this is your background, Kristen. She majored in, um, you know, directing and, and theater. And I thought, you know what, you're so good at it. I think that you would be perfect for it. Can you move to LA? And she did, and she trusted me enough. And, you know, um, so that's kind of all how it came about with, you know, the film, which is another, you know, <laughs> another topic, but um, we were able to get it on Netflix and our first ever documentary about animal welfare. So it, this has been a, ingrained in, I believe, in DNA since I was literally born. I knew that, I don't know, like I said, it's a calling. I don't know what it, what it is that, that, you know, I wake up every morning and I have this passion to want to give them a voice. I and mean, I've got 12 animals myself that I rescue that I take care of every day which is like above and beyond, like on a whole nother level. <laughs> it takes an hour every morning, an hour every night to like feed everybody clean. So um, when I mean I live and breathe this, I literally live and breathe this. Um, the entertainment is a perk and it's a platform, so. That yeah. is uh, <laughs> I, I, a I long answer. I don't know what to say, I mean, 12 animals. Tell me about, <laughs> tell me about your, your family members. Uh, that's the long answer, yeah. Uh, I've got nine cats and three dogs. Um, but there's always, you know, kittens here and there, bottle feed, and then find them homes. Uh, one of my partner organization, organizations is Eastwood Ranch, Allison Eastwood. Uh, and so she always has like, you know, the kittens that she pulls from the shelters and she calls me and she's like, Hey, can you, can you take a couple more? Or can you help me bottle feed? And I'm like, I already got nine. Like this is, you know, I'm at my max right now. <laughs> <laughs> are cats afraid of cucumbers you know i have not tried that but i've seen the videos and it's it's pretty hysterical so i i might want to yeah <laughs> i don't want to freak them out too much though because <laughs> they'll be like all nine of them they're just kind of they're really they're very funny their personalities are just you know i love cats that's actually how this all kind of started was cats so so yeah. i think what's really uh, compelling are stories so if you could kind of recall a, a particular story of an animal where you heard about that situation yeah. and you just felt really just that compassion towards that animal when we were filming the documentary last year uh in kenya um in south africa actually um we visited uh, the care for wild sanctuary petronal is the owner she's this incredible lady that has literally dedicated her life to rescuing baby rhinos from the rhino horn trade so what they do is they go into um, kruger national park and um, I mean, with this specific case, Summer um, was about three months old. She was laying next to her mother. Her mother had gotten poached and was killed for her horn, which is sadly at this point worth more than gold um, on the black market and as well as ivory. And this is why these animals are going extinct, um, which is a driving force, another driving force to what I do. And um, I just, when I heard this story and we had been covering it for years, I, I was shocked. I mean, like the fact that, this baby was left alone by itself mm. next to its dying mother for God knows how many days. And then these angels, Petronal and the Care for Wild team, swoop in, take the baby, and then dedicate their lives to rehabilitating these animals and then eventually um, doing a soft release back into the wild. And then, you know, they, of course, they find their groups and their, you know, their families. Um, it's just, I can't describe to you the pain when I met Summer. Um, she you could see she she knew that she was alone she knew that she was orphaned she had seen her mother get killed for her horn uh when they it's very graphic when they hack their faces the they bleed out i mean it's it's terrible i mean it's it's their nasal cavity that's what they're doing i mean these poachers they have um, no mercy for these animals and uh, that's another reason why there's none left in zimbabwe i was just in zimbabwe last week uh, visiting our anti-poaching team there and there's not one rhino left why is that um and and they've been around for millions of years they're prehistoric species so this is something that i, I would say summer's story um when i met her and i felt the pain when i put my hands on her her head and i just she just she was 
put her head down and was smelling me. And she was just um, a tiny, tiny baby. And she was just, she just almost lost it. It was just like, she totally gave up, totally gave up hope. And I said, you know what, this is, it's stories like this, that this is the reason why we have to be their voice. This is the reason why we have to speak out because if we don't, we're going to lose them very soon, like in the next five years. This was a traumatic. I mean, it's essentially PTSD for a little baby. A small infant, I mean, there, who is going to protect her rights? I mean, who's going to stand up for her? Uh, and then, of course, that loss, you know, we may not understand because we're humans and we can't communicate with the animals, but that loss is with, with Summer for, for the rest of her life. Yeah, I mean, the fact that... <laughs> We went to Sudan's grave. I don't know if you heard about Sudan, the last uh, male northern white rhino uh, that was left on the planet. So there was only two females left, and, and they're actually using in vitro fertilization to try to take um, Sudan's you know, DNA and one of their eggs and then implant it into a southern resident uh, rhino to repopulate the northern white rhino species. So um, they were successful, which is great. Uh, this is the first time it's ever been done on rhinos. Um, this could save the northern white rhino from extinction. But when we went to Sudan's grave, and he had just passed away that past year, um, and it said on the grave, the last northern white rhino, I'm like, what are we doing? Is, is money and greed more important than, than a species that's, a, like I said, a prehistoric species that's been around for millions of years? That's, I mean... It just doesn't make sense to me that we could be destroying the planet at this at this rate. And there's other things, of course, we're doing with the rainforest and deforestation and palm oil. I mean, it's endless. But we have, I mean, we're we have to do this now. You know, our, our children will not be able to see what we're able to see now if we don't act. And and it's very urgent. There's nothing like this uh, that's ever happened before, especially with the population explosion as well of humans. So. So, so let's talk about that a little bit, um, humans and our effects, not just from a poaching point of view, but from a climate change. How does climate mm -hmm. change affect these wild animals? And I think the other things you talk about is, you know, palm oil uh, industry as well. Mm -hmm. How does it affect that? And why, why should we even care? So I, I would say the most important thing um, that people don't realize with endangered species is that, um, you know, we, we graze most of the land um, on this planet for cattle. Uh, so we're clearing rainforest at an alarming rate uh, for meat consumption. So if people just reduce their meat or try a plant-based diet, there's so many great alternatives like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. And I mean, <clears throat> you wouldn't know the difference. And it's just made, it's made from plants. Uh, what you we would be saving not only endangered species, but the rainforest uh, from destruction. Um, you know, palm oil is a different issue uh, as well. Um, just as important because they're clearing the rainforest in Indonesia, um, Sumatra and Borneo when I was there last year. Um, I mean, hundreds of thousands of miles of palm oil plantations. And what they do is they uh, kill the indigenous species there. So the orangutans, um, which are also um, on the brink of extinction in Indonesia uh, as a result. So they consider them pests and most of the orangutans um, are shot. And the one that we rescued, this is another story um, I'll tell you briefly. Uh, a female orangutan, she was pregnant. We rescued her last year with Orangutan Information Center. She had a 22 bullet lodged in her side. She was pregnant. And um, we were able to catch her in a net. It took about a, an, an hour for the sedation to uh, kick in. And uh, they examined her and they had to relocate her because she was stuck in a palm oil and rubber plantation. Mm. And they were gonna bulldoze it to the ground and then they would have inevitably killed her and her baby. So, and then another thing is, is that um, the babies are sold on the black market for the pet trade. So if, if there is a palm oil plantation that is, you know, being planted, um, they clear the rainforest, they kill the mother orangutan or the father orangutan, they take the baby and they sell it on the black market. So there's a bigger issue that's going on here. Um, not just deforestation. Uh, it's not just uh, the endangered species issue. It's the meat issue. It's a climate change issue. Um, you know, we rely on our rainforest for majority of the oxygen on the planet, um, more so on, on our oceans. And that's a whole nother ball game. 70% of oxygen comes from the ocean, but the rest comes from our forests. So um, right now is the time. If, if we don't speak up, um, I'm, a, I'm a really afraid what um, the future is going to hold for um, our children. Oh, this is really powerful. The key word that's popping on my head is human greed. And that yep. greed uh, was present when you were, you know, at a young age modeling, right? And it, as well as into, in the just general Hollywood entertainment business. And then mm -hmm. you see that greed in the poaching industry. You see that greed in palm oil. 
you see that greed in forests uh, such as Amazon and the huge fires that's been out of control down in uh, Brazil and bordering countries. All of it is because of greed. It's, it's about economic gain. And that economic mm-hmm. gain is burning more fuel to produce and produce more of these you know, CO2 burning and emitting types of toxins. Um, mm-hmm. When will this greed stop? Is it about stopping the greed or is it about changing our mindset? So what, what's that message that you would want to give to the audience? How do we change our message? Because if you tell somebody I, who's e- enjoying their hamburgers, mm-hmm. tell them to substitute it with plant-based or something that's mm-hmm. manufactured in a lab, they may not like that. So how do we position the messaging, the story in such a way that resonates with people? I really think it's showing people compassion. And I think that what we're doing um, with World Animal News and Peace for Animals is really exposing what's happening. So exposing, um, actually raising awareness to the news of these great organizations that are doing such amazing work um, to protect the planet, to protect the animals. There's never really been before a platform that, that um, educates and shows people um, what these great people and organizations are doing. So that's why I created World Animal News really to expose that. So I think um, it's to to spread compassion, to spread the news, to spread, um, you know, uh, making the connection also to what's on your plate. So realizing that's a sentient being and um, they've gone through tremendous suffering in order to get that to become a hamburger, uh, which is incredibly sad just for a moment of happiness. Um, you don't know what that animal went through. And then just the energy, the negative energy, you're ingesting that. Um, so, you know, I, I also believe every, you know, of course we're all energy. So um, I believe in eating life, not death. And so I think that really just making that connection in simple things, simple things. And it's not just to what's on your plate. I believe it's um, to everything, to your pets, to a wild animals, to being compassionate towards each other. Because if we can't um, be compassionate for one another, how are we going to be compassionate for any other living being in our planet? And if we can't love, love ourselves, we can't do that either. So it starts within, and then you're able to um, protect the planet and be a voice for the voiceless. Our message was a long- today. <laughs> I think. Um, so how can people learn more about Peace for Animals? Well, um, you can definitely, um, you know, follow us on social media, uh, peace underscore for animals, the number four um, on Instagram. And then you can follow us on, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook. And then um, World Animal News is every day. So I've got a, a team of women that help me. Um, and again, back to your point, um, I surround myself with a lot of very strong women. So, and that's really what keeps me, keeps me going and keeps my drive focused. Um, I think that uh, the next generation of strong women are going to be leading the country. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, worldanimalnews.com. If you guys want to check out what's happening around the world with uh, breaking animal news and help. So on that note, I've been joined by Katie Cleary, founder of Peace for Animals. Katie, it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Pleasure speaking with you as well.